Hi, I'm Monica Long, SVP of Marketing at Ripple. And with me today is my colleague, Michelle Bond, uh, our Head of Global uh, Government Relations. We're here today to talk about a very timely topic, uh, the state of digital asset regulation around the world, and in particular, the importance of, of you know, regulation that really recognizes the differences across digital assets. Uh, so before we get started, Michelle, uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself. You have such an interesting background. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, well, first of all, this is the most exciting place uh, for policy. I think the fintech space is the, the hottest area for policy right now, um, which is really exciting. Uh, as far as my background goes, I am a lawyer by trade, and mm -hmm. um, I, I've, I've worked in various aspects of the law. I worked in uh, global law firms, and I worked uh, for the U.S. Senate Banking Committee, for the uh, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, and then I've trans transitioned now back into um, the private sector. Um, so I think joining Ripple has just been uh, really amazing because Ripple is a global company that's very uh, akin and just used to working with uh, regulated entities, financial institutions, uh, payment providers, and, um, and Ripple works uh, in the regulated uh, the existing regulated framework, which is which is um, very exciting. Uh, Ripple is, in addition, uh, a regulated company in and of itself. So we are a, a FinCEN regulated, and we also have a Department of Financial Services bit license. Um, I oversee the global government uh, relations uh, team, and we are engaging um, with 50 different governments worldwide, and um, it's a very exciting time. Um, as far as uh, fintech policy goes, I feel like this is going to be uh, a new and evolving space. So um, it's it's an exciting time. Yes, yes, and I mean, true to you know the very beginnings of the company, we've always really understood that. To, for these innovations with blockchain and digital assets to really take hold around the world, it needs to operate within a global regulatory framework. So just to start us off, and I mean, that's kind of a, a really big thing to take, take <laughs> on. So just to start us off, kind of tell us about the landscape. What What is the regulatory climate around the world? So um, that's a great question. It's really all over the spectrum at this point. Um, there are certain countries that are very friendly, and then there are certain countries that have um, they're a little bit more hostile. Um, I think they they maybe um, don't understand some of the new technologies, and and they're still you know looking to learn more about them. Mm -hmm. um, one of the the things that uh, we saw last week, which was very um, uh, encouraging and interesting, was uh, Commissioner Purse of the SEC. Uh, she was in Singapore. Uh, last week, and she gave a speech, and she talked a lot about um, the crypto and digital asset space, and she also talked about um, co-learning, co mm. and she was saying that jurisdictions um, can learn from each other, uh, as, as you know, in terms of developing frameworks um, and and educate one another, um, which is which was great. Um, there are certain jurisdictions that have been much more friendly um, in this space, which is which is really great. Um, just to name a few of them, uh, the UK Financial Conduct Authority um, has been one of the, the leaders in the space. Um, in fact, they they came out with a revised framework a couple of uh, weeks ago, which I thought was um, very clear and, and fantastic, honestly. Um, Asia Pacific has been uh, really um, at the, just the leading edge, uh, especially Singapore and Thailand. They've been fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, I would say um, Switzerland has been a very interesting one because they were able to sort of adopt the digital asset framework into their existing sort of uh, financial services framework, mm. and and they've just taken a really friendly approach uh, in this space, which is great. Um, Abu Dhabi is another one. Um, they've also been at the leading edge, and you know they're they're looking to attract business there. So uh, I feel like there are a lot of a lot of countries that are. Um, really, you know, trying to be at the forefront of this issue. So that's very encouraging and exciting. Yeah, so exciting. I mean, the the, the picture, we're getting more and more clarity. It seems like every yes. month, every, yeah. you know, as the years go on. Um, because the, the nature of this technology is global, meaning, you know, uh, 
there's a patchwork of uh, regulation across different countries and jurisdictions. The global coordination piece is another kind of complex layer to solve. What can we learn from the internet, the early days of the internet and how regulators really uh, approached that? Yeah, so um, I love the internet example um, because I feel like that's one example where there was a brand new technology where um, really the government had to adopt a new regulatory framework that uh, accounted for both innovation and also consumer protection. And if you looked at just the history of the way uh, regulation was before, uh, before you know, we, we had a new framework for the internet. It was based off of transistor radios and rotary <laughs> phones. <laughs> this was not a framework that was going to be malleable enough for yeah. for the internet. And um, that was it was um, fascinating because in 1997, the, in the the Clinton administration um, stepped in, and what they did was they uh, set forth a new framework for global electronic commerce. And in, in so doing, they made sure that there would be a um, a framework that that would um, account for not just the internet but also new technologies, and not and not paint all technologies with the same broad brush. Um, I, I would you know I would say like, even just looking at the internet now, what do we what do we see? We see e-commerce. Mm. We see online banking. Um, we see blogs, and of course, you know there there are so many different um, ways, um, you know that, that and frameworks that these things get you know regulated under, and uh, and it's great to see that they're not they're, they're they're not painted with one broad brush. So I think that that that's a really good example. That yeah, and I mean so speaking of that, um, you know, internet businesses are not all the same. There there's a broad array. Same with in the blockchain and digital asset industry. Um, there's been a lot of um, active discussion out in the public since the June launch of Facebook's Libra White Paper. Um, three congressional hearings since, mm -hmm. uh, lots of activity. And um, actually, in, as part of that, uh, Ripple, you know, we put our voice out there with an open letter to Congress um, calling for support of this kind of principle-based, yeah. um, adaptive and, and flexible frameworks for regulation. Can you drill down a bit more into that? Like, what kind of regulation are we really seeking here? Yeah. So I think, broadly speaking, we would always advocate for a principles-based framework as opposed to something that's more prescriptive. And the reason I say that is because principles of, uh, a principles-based framework would allow for new technologies and it, it can and it can be adaptive um, as time goes on. When you have something um, that's more prescriptive, um, it's static and um, and and frankly, it can get outdated pretty quickly. Um, and and it doesn't account for new innovation. So mm -hmm. that's something that um, that we you know we really advocate for as a principles based approach. The other thing that I I think is really important is to have clear definitions. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that it, that you know gives business Businesses comfort um, and moving forward, and um, and and regulators, it, it's good because they're able to put sort of you know guardrails on um, based on on those definitions. Um, the types of definitions that we've seen that have been really successful are the ones that. Um, will define what a digital asset is, and then they drill down a little bit more specifically about what an exchange token is, what a utility token is, what a securities token is, and and what that means um, as part of their framework. So I think that that's um, I think that's really incredible. Um, and then just as um, a threshold matter, I think you know when a regulator it has a, takes a friendly approach and and they you, you can tell that they they don't. Um, they don't want to stifle in innovation, mm -hmm. and that actually shows through in the frameworks that they put that they will put forth. Mm -hmm. um, so, so obviously, um, you know, I'd be a big proponent of that. So, it, like a recent, can you give us a recent example? Like, for example, the UK Financial Conduct Authority. Yes. So um, that's exactly so the the Financial Conduct Authority. That's exactly what they did. Um, in fact, when I was just saying about the you know the definition of digital asset and then the three tokens. Um, that's exactly what F the FCA just did in revised guidance, and um, and in fact, um, I thought they did a very good job of defining, um, you know, which digital assets fell into which categories, um, and, and 
Um, XRP, for example, has the attributes of both a utility token and an exchange token, which um, we thought, you know, was, was the right approach sense, and, yeah. and clear. Yes. Um, bef before we depart from uh, the topic du jour of Facebook's uh, Libra white paper, how, how do you think of the, uh, that pr proposed project in the context of RippleNet? So I think uh, Facebook Libra has uh, uh, a fundamentally different uh, strategic vision than Ripple. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that uh, we do is we really are um, partnering with financial institutions and we're operating within the existing regulatory framework. Um, that's actually always been a be the bedrock of, um, of Ripple strategy. Um, that's something very important to us. Um, the, other th the other thing that um, I think sets us apart is that we're really changing the infrastructure for cross-border payments um, and we're not consumer facing in any way. So mm -hmm. I think that also sets us apart. Um, I don't think it's a secret that Facebook has been um, facing enormous um, regulatory headwinds, um, you know, uh, with their uh, proposal. Um, I think, you know, as far as the uh, the existing financial system goes, I, I they are actually looking to circumvent um, the ex existing uh, payment providers, and, and they want to they want to do something different. Um, in fact. Uh, an incumbent like uh, Western Union, they've sp specifically said um, maybe Western Union would no longer be relevant mm -hmm. based on um, what you know what they're proposing. Um, we have taken at Ripple, you know, a very different approach. In fact, one of our most exciting partnerships um, is the, is the MoneyGram yeah. um, partnership that we just announced in June, uh, which has been. Um, exciting for the for us, it's been exciting for MoneyGram. Um, it's been wonderful watching it go live, and, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's um, it's just it's very different um, than the you know the, the approach that we've seen. And at this point, Facebook Libra is really just a white paper. So I um, you know it, only time will tell. We'll see if they actually do um, you know meet their goal of launching by next year, or maybe not, we'll see. Um, but but that's something I think that, you know, everyone is watch watching, inclu including policymakers. Yes, yes. I mean, it seems, it seems unlikely at this point. Yeah. Um, and speaking of the money, MoneyGram has gone live on RippleNet. Um, they're using XRP for on-demand liquidity, and they actually just had their uh, earnings call. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, here are the CEO, Alex Holmes, and other executives talking about how that went. Uh, so, lots of progress on the regulatory front, which is which is awesome. That's so great, and um, we can't expect every all the pieces to fall into place overnight. What are the challenges and opportunities you see across the regulatory landscape? Um, I, I think one thing that we're seeing is that there is a real sense of urgency right now um, to see. Uh, Global regulators adopt clear uh, frameworks for for um, for regulation uh, in the fintech space, blockchain, digital asset space. Um, so I, you know, I think that's very important because um, otherwise companies will leave um, jurisdictions to go to uh, you know more more favorable places. Um, so that's that's something that um, we are seeing. Uh, I. Uh, you know, I think it's great actually because there's been a significant upward trend of jurisdictions uh, making an effort to mm -hmm. adopt these clear frameworks. Um, so that that's been uh, extraordinarily helpful and encouraging. We have also seen, you know, areas where people have decided to uh, officially leave. Uh, in fact, at the Senate Banking Committee hearing last week. Uh, Jeremy Allaire of Circle, CEO, uh, he he testified uh, before the Senate and said Circle would was was going to be moving some certain of their operations to Bermuda, and the reason for that was because of a more favorable and clear mm -hmm. regulatory framework. Um, so that's a you know a real world example. Uh, and regardless of what you think of Libra, um, you have to ask the question: Why is it? that they've decided to set up shop in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And and again, you know, it's a friendly jurisdiction and uh, with a with a clear a clear regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. So makes sense. So thank Michelle, thank you so much for your time and all your wisdom. Um, before we leave, two more questions. What 
what's your two to four year view of the global regulatory landscape? What do you think is going to shake out? So, um, so like I said, this is a really exciting um, policy area, and um, it is certainly we're seeing an upward trend. We're seeing regulators talking with each other, co-learning from each other. Um, they're adopting new frameworks, and and really. I mean, they're doing they're doing a great job. Um, I think there's some there's a lot more work to be done, and I think you know, Ripple is very excited to play a role in in helping um, and you know and to explain uh, to the extent that we can be helpful about uh, you know our products and um, our technology solutions and being in the fintech space and we're we're, we're helping with um, the blockchain narrative and and explaining you know how that works to policymakers. Um, so that's something that you know we're actively engaged in um, with 50 governments uh, around the world, mm -hmm. and um, and I think that the regulators are hearing us, and I think that they've been um, extraordinarily um, receptive. I think you know from a U.S. standpoint, uh, the U.S. I think is uh, trying to uh, provide some more clarity, which I think is a very positive um, development, um, because at the end of the day, there's a significant risk there that we'll lose. Um, We'll lose business to overseas, and what does that mean? It means we lose innovation, mm -hmm. we lose tax revenues, and we lose jobs, and that's not a good out outcome. So there is a mm -hmm. significant risk there um, if we don't if we don't get it right in the U.S. But globally, I think um, I think regulators, um, really on the whole, are, are are doing really well with this. So if if uh, regulators are out there watching, and you have a, I mean, you spend your days and nights talking to them, absolutely. But uh, if you if you could send a message um, right now, what would it be? We need a clear regulatory framework. Um, yeah. We have to have we have to have clear definitions, um, especially uh, if it's um, a regulator. Like for example, the U.S. Um, has has. Um, historically always been a global market leader um, I think that it's important for them to for the US to uh, similarly adopt um, definitions and have that uh, principles based framework and have have a, a framework that's clear for business and, and company uh, and companies um, and I think that 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 clarity will help um, will help with the US and and certainly on a global scale we've seen that um, there's been a lot of success with that approach. Absolutely. Well, thank you again, thank Michelle. You. <laughs> and, and thank you for tuning in. Thanks for joining us. If you have uh, more questions or seeking more information, you can visit ripple.com and contact us. Thank you.